good morning. Um, as you can see, we have a number of different people who are isolating at the moment or who are unwell, but we are so glad that you've chosen to worship with us this morning and we're very excited about all that God is going to do in our midst this morning. Just some housekeeping, I guess, some announcements right at the start. I want to say a huge thank you to everybody who was able to come down yesterday to help with an impromptu work day that we had, getting the place spruced up, making it look lovely, smell lovely, and we really, really appreciate everybody. Just I'm going to name drop because I think that gratitude is important. Um, even if even if the people don't want their names dropped, I think it's important that they're honoured for what they've done. So we had people indoors helping with Mervyn, Rosemary, Pat, Jillian, Claire, Colin and Karen. I arrived at 10 o'clock and I said to Karen, I thought Rosemary was coming. Turns out she'd been and gone. You know? What a woman. What a woman. Efficient, quick, does her task. Fantastic. Outdoors, we had our own ranger, Gary, who was out weeding, making the place look lovely. Uh, as well, you'll notice that we have a, a clearer projector. This week, Ali and Henry spent a lot of time uh, this week putting in and installing this new projector, running cables. As you can see, they're all up here and everything. Not an easy job, so we are very, very <laughs> thankful to them. Um, and uh, it was great because I got the chip buddies. So there you go. There you go. My wife didn't know that. Um, so there you are. But every little helps, and these mornings are really great opportunities uh, for friendship, for fellowship, and also to honour God by keeping His sanctuary and His house um, up to scratch and clean as well. So please come and join us next time if you're able. Uh, what we're going to do? We have a board meeting tomorrow night, and uh, they don't know this, but we're going to set four different dates for throughout the year where we will come together and we'll do stuff like this. We'll give you them way in advance. You can put them in your diaries and if you're able to come and do little, that's great. If you're able to come and do much, that's great. And if you feel all you're able to do is make the tea and coffee, you're very, very welcome to come along as well. Because um, little is much when God is in it. Um, and it's great to be together as well. As I said, board members, we have a board meeting tomorrow night, half past seven here. Lots to get through. If you need any of the reports, come and see me afterwards and I can give you some of the handouts. Wednesday evening, who was at, who was at Bible study and prayer on Wednesday evening past? There was a number of us here and a number who aren't here just now for different reasons as well. We had an amazing, a really amazing time where we felt the presence of God really come in power. Um, to encourage and to build us up but also as we pressed in and we sought him on behalf of others we actually set out to do 20 minutes of prayer and 40 minutes of study and we ended up doing an hour of prayer because God's presence was so heavy in this place and we really want to encourage you to come along and experience a little bit more of all that God has for us and who he is and what he longs to do for us as his people come along on Wednesday evening we will definitely definitely be starting our series on Isaiah this week and we'll also be spending time in prayer too. As I said at the start there are a few different people who are isolating, a few different people who are unwell um, and not able to be here for a variety of different reasons and we just want to spend some time now just coming before the throne of grace, coming before our God, praying for them, standing in the gap on their behalf but also praying that God would really come in power as we gather here this morning. His word tells us that where two or three are gathered, there he is in the midst and that to bless us. So we are encouraged that God is here and we just pray now to welcome him and give him the position that he is due, that he can do as he pleases. So let's just pray together. Lord, we are so thankful for who you are. We are so thankful for the love that you have for us. We're so thankful that you never change, that you are indeed the same yesterday, today and forever. And Lord, we come before you today in expectation and anticipation, believing with heart and with soul that we will encounter you this morning. Lord, we, we say to you, have your way. May your will be done, not ours. May you be enthroned and lifted high in this place. Lord, may your glory fall in mighty power this morning. Lord, for those who are unable to be with us in person and are maybe watching online, who are isolating, who are maybe unwell, 
at this time, Lord. We pray a special blessing upon them um, as they tune in to this service, or Lord, even as they sit in your presence within their very home. Lord, be unto them all that they need you to be in these days. Lord, heal them where they need healing. Move in their lives where there needs to be transformation. Lord, we don't want to tell you how to do your job. Lord, we simply pray your will over their lives and over ours. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name, in holy expectation and anticipation. Amen. Amen. Do we want to worship God together? Do we want to stand? Let's do that if we're able. And let's sing a great hymn of the church. Love divine, all loves except
Um, at this point in our service, who loves a good kid song? Yes. Right? That is that is a really good response. I remember the first time that I asked that about three years ago, and everybody did this. Right? So we're making progress, but kids are such a huge part of who we are as a church. We love them, we value them. Who was here for the nativity? Right? The nativity was excellent, wasn't it? It was really excellent. And Jody's going, I was Mary, I was Mary. We know. <laughs> and you were great. Give the kids a round of applause. <laughs> I know that was last year, but last week being so quick after New Year, a lot of them weren't able to be here. And we just want to say that we love you, we appreciate you, and we think that you guys are ace. Yes. And we know how much you love a good kid song. And we love a good kid song as well. So I know, I know that you've just sat down. But if everybody could stand again, I can't believe I'm going to say this, follow me, <laughs> right? But if any of the kids want to come and they want to help me, that would be very much appreciated. We're going to sing a favourite of theirs, Jesus, you're my superhero. If you have legs and you're able to stand on them, why are you sitting? Let's stand together and let's do Jesus, you're my superhero. that they bring to us as a congregation. We thank you for the value that they have as your children as well. And Lord, 
We thank you that they're not the church of tomorrow, but they're very much part of your church today. Lord, we pray that we would be a people who encourage them, a people who build them up, and a people who allow them to be kids, but people who tell them of the love and show them the love that you have for them. Lord, we pray for Gillian and for Chloe as they're through with them just now. Lord, we pray that as they share of the love of Jesus with them, Lord, that you would capture their young hearts and that, Lord, salvation would take place in this place today by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue to worship in song. I'm going to let you remain seated and get some breath back in your lungs. But we're going to sing another great song together. Here is love vast as the ocean. of scripture. If you've been to a wedding recently it's probably a very familiar passage and one which you will have no doubt heard at said wedding. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and you've probably guessed by now that today's theme is love. It says this, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love (coughs) is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures 
all things. Love <coughs> never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three. Or as one translation says, these three things remain. But the greatest of these is love. And this is the word of the Lord. We're going to sing one more time before we come and gather around that word. I do encourage you, if you're able, to stand together as we worship God and we cast our mind to Calvary.
praise your name this morning. And as we come and gather around your word, we pray that you would illuminate it to our hearts. For Lord, as we so often pray and believe with heart and soul, this is the living word of the living God for us, your living people. So Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, speak to us, challenge us, correct us where we need to be corrected, encourage us where we need to be encouraged. And Lord, may we be blessed by your word and be a blessing to you as we receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Characteristics are very important. How we describe people, and perhaps more importantly, how people describe us is very important. Actions and characters, characters speak louder than words, don't they? How often have you been to a service, be it a wedding or be it a funeral service, and somebody has stood up and they've talked about somebody and you're like, that's not who I remember. <laughs> that's not who I remember them being. But characteristics and the way that people see us and view us, it is important as the children <coughs> of God. And I don't know if you're like my Chloe, but every time we are going to have the opportunity to go away or we're going to make a big purchase, Chloe also goes straight to the reviews. Always, always, always. Her motto is, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. Right? But she goes straight to the reviews. I'm kind of one of those guys who walks into a shop, knows what he's going for, lifts it, takes it to the till and goes home. When Chloe's making a purchase of any kind, be it clothes, be it um, a, a night away, be it a fridge, whatever it is, there is always a rigorous review process that goes on. She wants to make sure that she's getting the most bang for her buck. Do you remember that advert for the uh, fence paint that says it does exactly what it says on the tin? Right? She wants to make sure that it does exactly what it says on the tin. How something is described and how it actually is can sometimes be two very different things. And we're left scratching our heads going, but it said it would be this and it's this. I'm sure that many of us could tell lots of different stories of times where we maybe bought something on the internet or we've been sold something over the phone and it has arrived and we're like, that is not what you described to me. Before the girls came, our last holiday was in July 2020. It was just, we were just coming out of lockdown and the border had just opened, which meant that we could go to Donegal. So we booked a couple of nights away in Donegal. I, I wondered whether or not to name the hotel, but I will. Um, we booked into the Ballyliffin Hotel near Malinhead. Little did we know, we went and we, we explained to Chloe's dad that that's where we were going. He knows the, the <coughs> island of Ireland very well because um, he was a, a lorry driver for a time and delivered tyres. And he says, oh, that's a brilliant one. Brilliant. And you got it for that price? Absolutely amazing. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. Reviews are excellent. He says, I've stayed in it myself on a week off on holiday in my younger years and it was great then and the reviews are still fantastic now. So we drove in a wee, in our wee see at Leon as it was then, we drove across the border and we <coughs> hit, the, hit the roads. I took the R plates down, don't tell anyone. And, uh, <laughs> and, and we, we, we drove and it was great. And then we arrived at the hotel. And we realised very quickly that there were two Ballyliffin hotels. One about where Gary is, and no word of a lie, one at the top of Chamberlain Street, just there. And we had paid a price for the one down there, and we got the one down here. And we went and, until the day that we die, we'd probably say it was the worst holiday we've ever had. How something is described and how it actually is 
sometimes are two different things. But that should not be said of the church. Back in November, we shared with you the vision that we believe that church, uh, that God has given us as a church for the next three years. And contained within that vision were five values. Five values where we say we will be. We believe that this is the church that we're called to be. The church that God is calling us to be in this time, in this season, in this community. The forming of habits are very important, very important. And sometimes it's very uncomfortable to kick a habit or to form a habit. And sometimes this uncomfortability is difficult, but it's always necessary. It's important that we set focused values, which are true to who we feel that God is calling us to be as his people but that we also aren't rigid about it and that we work in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. These values are things that I would argue that we are already doing, but there is always room for improvement. The small conscious decisions which we make are important, no matter how insignificant they may appear to be at the time. For example, have you ever had a choice word with somebody? You know what I mean when I say a choice word? You feel you've been hard but fair. Maybe you've, you've had a choice word with someone or maybe somebody's had a choice word with you. And maybe you or that other person felt that it was totally unmerited. Totally unmerited. So instead of um, Instead of dealing with the issue, you begin to avoid the individual. Or the individual begins to avoid you. You'd rather avoid than sort it out and clear the air. Then the next stage is awkwardness. They're walking on up the street and you maybe cross the road. You see them coming and you do all that you can to get out of the way. And then before you know it, you can't stand to be in the same room as that person, right? You can't stand to be in the same room as one another. <coughs> and that leads not only to awkwardness for yourself, but awkwardness to everybody else around you. It seems like such a trivial thing that it started with just a choice word. But we've all seen it play out in church. We've all seen it play out in work. We've all seen it play out in family and we've all seen it play out in our own lives or the lives of our people. Very often the root was something so minuscule, something so minuscule and insignificant, but it was allowed to gain a foothold. And suddenly the choice word, or whatever it was, became a whole thing. You're not in because you know what I'm talking about. The purpose of our values as a church is that we seek to change that narrative. We seek to change the narrative. We seek to be the church and people that God has called us to be in this place and in this generation. As the years go by, the emphases might change slightly, but these values outline who we feel God is calling us to be in this time and season. And the good news I like to give you a bit of good news every week, don't I? The good news is that each one of us have our part in playing to help make it become a reality. We each have our part to play in ensuring that the way in which we describe ourselves is the actual experience of those whom we serve and come in contact with as the church. Let's not let be this wee hotel down here. Let's be the hotel up there. So let's be everything that we're described to be. A reminder of these values for you is this. The first value is love. That we will demonstrate the love of Christ by our actions. We will love others and help where we can to deal with the issues 
which they face. Second one's compassion. And we're going to unpack these over the next five weeks. Compassion. We will show compassion to those we encounter, regardless of background or life circumstances. Welcome. Whether it's on a Sunday or during the week, we will be welcoming to whoever comes across our path, treating them as part of the family and welcoming them to join us. Authentic. To be a family in which each person is encouraged to be who they are and who they are created by God to be. And that they are accepted regardless of what stage of the journey of faith in which they find themselves. In other words, we will be a church where there is no need for pretext and there is no need for masks. People can come as they are. And we will be faithful. We are faithful people. We will be faithful in our responsibilities as part of the family of God in every area of our lives. Be that time, finances, gifts and graces and the pursuit of holy living. Recognising that God himself is a faithful God. And when one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. When somebody else suffers, we suffer. And how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to unpack this more over the next five weeks. But how are we going to do this? We're going to be faithful in the place of prayer. We're going to be faithful in the place of prayer, continually laying ourselves before God's grace and mercy. We're also going to keep each other accountable to the values. We're going to encourage one another and carry one another's burdens. And we're going to do it without pointing fingers. We're going to do it without choice words because we know what choice words can lead to, right? But we're going to do it loving one another, encouraging one another, building each other up. Not wagging the finger, but throwing the arm around and saying, come on, let's go. And we're always going to be open to the moving and prompting of the Holy Spirit of God. Recognising that it is his church. And that we simply have the privilege of being co-laborers. It is his will, not ours, that must be done. So that's a big snapshot. You're going to get this in a piece of paper very soon. So don't worry. Right? But today we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at that first value. And that first value is love. We're going to spend some time looking at love. We've got to ask ourselves the question then, what does love mean? Whenever we say love, what does it mean? Because it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So we need to define what we mean by love. And the best way that I can do this is this way. Growing up in Sunday school, who had the privilege of going to Sunday school when they were younger? Pretty much everybody, right? Right? But growing up in Sunday school, I had a Sunday school teacher, many of you might know him, his name's Ian McElroy. Right? And Ian told us this one day, he said, if it's in the Bible once, it's important. And if it's in the Bible twice, it's really important. Right? So if it's in the Bible once, it's important. If it's there twice, it's really important. Using the King James Version of the Bible as a reference, the word love appears in the Bible 300 and 10 times. 310 times. Right? If it's there once, it's important. If it's there twice, it's very important. We don't have enough time to go through all the berries. <laughs> this is very important. 131 times in the Old Testament and 179 times in the New Testament. I guess it's fair to say that the concept of love is very important in the scriptures and therefore should and must be very important to us as the people of God. Of course, what is translated into the English word love can mean a lot of different things within the Greek and Hebrew languages in which the Old and New Testaments were written. It can mean bonds of empathy, friendship, romance, but also unconditional. This unconditional love is agape. Agape. Turn to the person beside you and say agape. Right? Agape. Right? 
It is the love that God extends to us as his children and that we are in turn called to show to those around about us. And this is the kind of love that we are talking about today. The passage which we read together earlier from 1 Corinthians 13 is, as I said, very popular at wedding ceremonies. Quick show of hands, who hadn't read at their wedding? Nobody. Oh, oh, one. What, two, one, two. A few people had it read at their weddings. It's the most popular passage to be read at weddings. So you would, you, you would be forgiven for thinking that this passage was a romantic passage. It can be applied that way, but it's not primarily a romantic passage. The words contained within actually speak to that agape, that unconditional love which we are called as the people of God to show, not only to those who we may be married to or to our family, but rather to each and every person that we come in contact with. But how are we to show this up? It's all well and good saying we need to do this, but how are we to show it? How are we to do it? How are we to go about this? We are called, as the passage tells us, to be a people who are patient and kind, who do not envy or boast, who aren't arrogant or rude, who don't insist on always getting their own way, who aren't irritable or resentful, who rejoice in the truth, not in wrongdoing, who bear all things, who hope all things, and who endure all things who love even when they've reached the end of the rope and they simply cannot be bothered, who place love and the extension of the love that we have received from Christ at the forefront of who we are and of all that we do. That's a really high calling, isn't it? I remember as a young person, you might look at me and say I'm still a young person and to that I say thank you very much right but as a young person I remember on youth weekends we would often be given this passage and we were we would be asked to replace the word love with our name Sammy is patient and Chloe laughs Sammy is kind Sammy does not envy Sammy does not boast whenever we replace the word love with our names it becomes a lot more real doesn't it? And whenever I replace love with my name, I go, uh-oh. Uh-oh. It's a high calling. But as we'll find out a little bit later on, don't switch off. Because we're not called to that high calling in our own strength. We're not called to sort this all out on our own. So park that thought. Remember, though, and it's important to state this, we are all uniquely created in the image of God. There are things that make you tick that I just could not want in my life. And there are things that make me tick that you would be like, you're a bit weird, <laughs> right? We are uniquely created in the image of God. There will be things that I like that you don't like and things that people... Uh, things that people like that I don't like, right? Similarly, there will be people who you find easy to love, who I find difficult to love, and people who I find easy to love that you just simply cannot stand. It's important that we know that nowhere in all of the scripture does it once say that in order to be a follower of Jesus Christ that we have to like everybody all of the time. Sometimes we get confused, and I think it's important that that's stated from the front by a minister on the authority of the Word of God. We are not called to like everybody all of the time. But here are these words which Jesus shared with his disciples in the upper room the night before he would be crucified. He said this, Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, 
Where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. Notice love, not like, love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus didn't say that the world would know his disciples by how much they like each other, but rather how much we love each other. There are people in my life who I love deeply. I love them deeply. But at the same time, if I'm honest, most of the time I don't really like them. Right? I don't really like who they've become. I don't really like who they are when they're around certain people. I get frustrated by them sometimes. And if I'm being honest, there are some people who I love deeply. And right now I can't really stand them. Right? I was being serious. Right? But I think if you're honest, there are probably people in your life that you feel the same way about. You love them with every fiber of your body, but who they are right now, you kind of want to take a step back and you want to go, mm, don't know if I can deal with that. I don't like the way that they behave. I don't like who they've become, but I still love them. I still love them. Why? Not just because Jesus commanded that I had to, but because they are God's masterpiece, uniquely created in his image and in need of experiencing for themselves the same love which was extended on the cross as Jesus laid down his life to purchase my freedom. And should they accept his gift of salvation, it can be their freedom as well. Why do I still love them? Because God does. Why do I still love them? Because God laid down his life for them. Why do I still love them even when I can't stand them? Because I have been forgiven much. And I have been loved much. And this same love we are called to extend impartially. As the world looks at the church, as, as the world looks at the church, what does it see? As it looks at the church throughout the world, what does it see? To our shame, I don't know if the first answer on people's lips would be that they see love radiating, or that they see the love of Christ displayed. They probably use other words, and lots of people would probably use colourful language, but as the people of God in this place, at this time, we are called to change the perception in our corner of God's vineyard, in our community. We are called to be a people who love relentlessly, who forgive unconditionally, who consider others greater and more important than ourselves for the cause of Christ. Why? Well, by this people will know that we are his disciples. That's great, but how is this even possible? How is it even possible? Jesus has a lot to say about love, particularly in the Gospels. His ministry was one of love, compassion, welcome, authenticity and faithfulness. Indeed, even Paul in his letters and Peter and John and Titus, even the Old Testament prophets and patriarchs, you'll be hard pressed to read the word of God and not encounter love exemplified, love explained and love encouraged. One of the things which Jesus has to say about love is key to our understanding of what it is and how we are to put it into action. He has called us to be, in, well, rather put this in context, he's been involved in a little bit of a back and forth with the Sadducees who are some of the religious leaders of the day. And they've been having a debate about the resurrection of the dead. Essentially, they're trying to trip him up. They're trying to trip Jesus up. They're trying to back him into a corner and they're trying to embarrass him in front of the crowd that have gathered round to listen. But rather, Jesus, you know, the fact that he's the son of God, that he's all powerful and he's all knowing, he wows the crowd with his answer. 
and leaves the Sadducees red faced. Following on from these words, we read these famous words. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these commandments depend all the law and prophets. Jesus is essentially asked here to summarise the whole of the Old Testament scriptures. And he does so as follows. Love God and love people. No ifs, no buts. Love God, love people. No ifs, no buts. And the order here is significant. If we try and flip it round the other way, it simply would not work. If we want to love people, then love God, it wouldn't work. If we try to do one without the other, if we try to love people without loving God, it simply would not work. In order to love people with this love that he has called us to love them with, we must First, love God with all of our being. And conversely, we simply cannot say that we love God completely if we do not love those around us. God himself is love. And he calls us to extend his love to those whom we come in contact with. If we are to be the church that God has called us to be, if we are to be the church who extend love as a value, and by the way, a value is part of who you are. It's a part of your identity. It's one of those characteristics that people will look at you and say they were a loving person. They loved relentlessly. They forgave relentlessly. If we are to be a people who demonstrate the love of God by our actions, who love others and help where we can to deal with the issues that they face. If we're to be this church that God is calling us to be, which we believe of heart and soul that he is, we have to be devoted to the source. We have to be devoted to the source of love. We're told in the letter of 1 John that God is love. Not just that God is loving, but that God himself is love. We have to be loving the Lord our God with all of our being. Allowing him to do his sanctifying work within us. Spending time with him in the place of prayer and in the word. Devoting ourselves completely to him. Praying with Jesus in the garden. Not my will, but yours. Be done. This love that we're called to extend, it's sacrificial. It costs us something. It costs us something. It costs us this. We need to afford God the rightful place as Lord of our lives and as our all in all. We're not going to sing it, but you know that song, Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be. If we do not have love, if we do not seek him, if we do not allow him that rightful place, those words are just platitudes. Those words are just words. But this love that we're called to extend and this love which we experience ourselves from God, that's the, that's the kind of love that this word, this song describes. Simply put, we cannot be the church that God has called us to be unless we dedicate and devote our lives to him. That he may be, be, that he may be made known in our community and glory brought to his name through the way that we live, serve and love those around us. So, we're called to be a people of love. We're called to be a people of love. I'll say that again. 
We're called to be a people of love. So let us come to the source this morning, surrendering our whole being to him, that we may be used for his glory and that others may experience the love which he has for them and which we extend to them as his children. You up for that? It's costly, but it's worth it. It's costly, but it's worth it. And it will, will lead to transformation in this community. Will we pray together? Lord, we thank you for the simple yet profound challenge that you have laid before us this morning. Lord, help us to love you with all of our being that we may be the people that you have called us to be in this place at this time. That we may love those around us and that glory may be brought to your name and transformation experienced throughout the streets of East Belfast. Lord, in the silence, we rededicate ourselves to you. In the silence, Lord, we ask that you would fill us up as individuals and corporately together as your church, that we may go and show the love which you have extended to us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just behind me on the screen, we're going to play a song. This is going to be our one of our songs for the next five weeks we're learning it together i wasn't too sure whether or not the band knew it so it might be that the band play it in future weeks but it's a great song of unity it's a great song that sort of exemplifies who we are called to be it's called oh how good it is if you know it sing along if you don't know it listen drink it up it'll also be on the youtube channel later on so you can go and listen and familiarize yourself with it again but let's sing or listen to these words together and maybe receive them as a benediction this morning as well
forgive as He forgives. When we live as one, we all share in the love of the Son with the Father and the Spirit. So with one voice we'll sing to the I was recently reminded that when my grandfather was the minister here nearly 40 years ago, nearly 40 years ago, my mother won't let, like me telling you that, but nearly 40 years ago, he used to often start or finish services with this. If anyone here has a grievance against a brother or sister, sort it out. If anyone here has a grievance against a brother or a sister, in the Lord, sort it out. So often we can take a step back and we can avoid these things. But perhaps one practical application of our message this morning could be that we sort out any grievances that we have. That's difficult. It requires a wee bit of sacrifice. The other people, the other individual might not even know that you're harboring these feelings or these thoughts. But don't let the enemy have a foothold. Sort it out. If anyone here has a grievance against another, sort it out. And sort it out now. And now may the peace of God go with us wherever we go. And may we experience the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And be a blessing to those who we come in contact with. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.